I'm Colin Sanders and this is the History Books Review with my latest instalment of my extended review of Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. If you are one of the small but dedicated group of interested enough to follow my reviews as they come out, you'll probably notice that I've skipped chapter 43. I'm doing this because, well, because I am and I don't need a reason, but I'll be going back to it next, so don't worry, I haven't forgotten it. One of the great things about being an Enlightenment thinker is it gives you a great deal of self-confidence. Most historians in most ages would fight shy of reviewing the entire history of the Roman legal system from the earliest days to the time of Justinian in a single chapter. Gibbon has no such inhibitions and this is exactly what we get. I skipped this chapter the first time I read the book some 40 years ago. I only skim read it when I read it again 15 years ago. It's only now that I've set myself the task of reviewing it that I've finally given it the degree of attention it calls out for. I'll confess that it's not exactly a page turner, but it is an important subject. One of the big things about the Roman Republic and the later empire was the respect for the rule of law. This is something that we have inherited from them and something that is very important in the modern world. The footnotes to the public domain copy of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire that I have on my Kindle make it clear that this is a subject that they were very interested in in the 19th century. We should probably be a lot more interested in it than we are. It's something that's very easy to take for granted and I'll come back to that. The overview in a nutshell is that Roman law was codified very early on. The first laws were laid down by the founding kings. Romulus did the basic meat and drink ones. The ones relating to religion were attributed to Nerva, the second king of Rome, whose life is lost in the mists of time and indeed probably never existed in the first place. But as he got them from conversations with a nymph, that gives them a nice bit of a mystical input. After the kings had been replaced by an oligarchy, a working party of ten senators called the Decembers were set up to codify the laws. These were issued in the form of ten tablets. The tablets were one of the key icons of the Romans' image of themselves and were treated with the kind of reverence that the Americans have for their constitution. And like the American constitution, they were developed, altered and modified over time as the situation changed and as a result of political pressure from interest groups. The plebeians objected that the laws favour the wealthy, as laws tend to do. They insisted on a revision of the rules via a popular assembly. This added a further two tablets that brought them up to 12, which were issued on brass plaques and became the totemic symbol of the legal system. But even with the enhanced number of tablets, they weren't enough to provide a full and definitive legal system. The gap had to be filled and the Senate later took on the role of creating laws after the kings had been expelled. That was the Romans' own version of the story anyway and Gibbon takes it at more or less face value. Modern historians give it short shrift. It's all a bit fanciful and there is nothing that counts as actual evidence to back up any of the details, or, or any of it really. Whatever its origins, the Romans were a very law-abiding bunch. They continued to have a high degree of respect for the rule of law throughout the history of the Republic and the Empire. This sort of fits in with the general spirit of the myths the Romans believed. The myths are things that are made up, which are still nonetheless in some way true. I think the regard for the legal system was something that reflects that it was a hot political issue. We'll never know the particulars, but the outline sort of rings true to me. One of the features of early Roman society back in the early days of the Republic was that it was very egalitarian. There was a maximum limit on how much land any one farmer could own. As Rome expanded, this rule was not applied to stuff acquired on foreign adventures. Uh, if you could grab it with your hands, it was yours. The Latin verb for grabbing is mancipe, so 
property, including people, you had grabbed from abroad was yours. You had emancipated it. We still use the word emancipation for the process of escaping from slavery. My guess is that the influx of wealth from early conquests destabilised the egalitarian republic, and it was this that led to popular involvement with lawmaking. In the story, we might hear the echo of a big struggle between the classes as the newly acquired wealth made the rich richer. The establishment had made concessions, as they usually do under pressure, and they had rolled the reforms back as soon as they could, again, as they do, whenever they can get away with it. By the time we get to the stage of recorded history, the Senate is back in firm control, although there were still popular assemblies with an influence on the way the law was drawn up. But the Senate was soon to be challenged not by the people, but by the emperors. Augustus paid lip service to the constitution, but steadily undermined its authority. It was now possible to make law by imperial decree. The empire had been established with support to some extent of the populace, and populism was to prove the precursor to tyranny. The popular assemblies were soon suppressed. The Senate, on the other hand, soon found a role as a support for the new regime. It's a lesson that is worth learning from history. The masses are useful tools for demagogues, but they rarely reward their supporters. The emperors found the Senate a useful and compliant body for dealing with day-to-day -day lawmaking but also found issuing edicts was a convenient way of handling the needs of a large and sophisticated empire. Augustus got the ball rolling on this and the trend steadily increased. So over time, the amount of law both grew and the sources of it became more diverse. What was needed was a clear structure for where to go to, to find the relevant law in a particular dispute. There were a couple of attempts at codifying it, but it was a project that really needed someone to really get it by the scruff of the neck and sort it out. Few of the empires had the drive, the intelligence and the secure position needed to start doing this. Justinian was one of the few, and he was also blessed with a long reign to enable him to do so. In a career full of achievements, it is probably the one that has had the biggest long-term impact on history. As Gibbon eloquently puts it, the vain titles of the victories of Justinian are crumbled into dust, but the name of the legislator is, is inscribed on a fair and everlasting monument. Under his reign and by his care, the civil jurisprudence was digested in the immortal works of the Code, the Pandex and the Institutes. The public reason of the Romans has been silently or studiously transfused into the domestic institutions of Europe, and the laws of Justinian still command the respect or obedience of independent nations. It was probably more true in his own day, but it's still not surprising to see a bit of Latin in a legal document. The Roman legal system continues to influence how we are ruled to this day in all parts of Europe and the world beyond it. The great undertaking of codifying the Roman law was in the end the most influential of all the many influential things that Justinian did. So it is surprising to discover just how quickly he got the thing knocked off. The first draft was issued within six years of getting started on the project and revisions started appearing shortly afterwards. To get one major project finished in an astonishing time is one thing, but Justinian had already pulled off the same trick in his building of the great cathedral of Hagia Sophia. It isn't unusual for despotic rulers to take the credit for the achievements of their underlings, but it isn't likely that Justinian lucked out twice. You had to conclude that the guy was an exceptional project manager. For ability, I would say that Justinian is in the select league of emperors who command respect simply for getting stuff done. As Gibbon says, jurisprudence is a subject that is of interest to few and of entertainment to none, but there are a few interesting facts that come to light. Naturally, a lot of it is to do with property. This makes for dull reading when you're talking about other people's property, but must be pretty gripping when you're talking about your own. 
it's easy to see why barbarians and particularly barbarian chiefs and nobles who had had a lot of property would find the idea of getting into the empire where there was a system in place to protect their property attractive. It explains why the Romans found it so easy to recruit barbarian troops and also why it was so rare that the barbarians actually threatened the existence of the state itself. Looking back at the crisis of the third century it is hard to imagine how the empire survived but maybe enough people wanted it to continue to give their extra chance. Property rights are an important feature of any stable society and it was something that the Romans took extremely seriously. It is worth remembering that while the Roman world was full of cities and urban settlements it was still primarily an agrarian society. If you wanted a continual supply of income only farms and mines could provide it. There were Romans who made a tidy living out of writing, working for the government and acting as lawyers but there weren't many of these people and their living was always precarious. Their interests weren't represented very strongly in the legal system at all. What they were really interested in was inheritance. Getting hold of and establishing title to productive farmland was a matter of intense interest. Women's rights were not a priority for the Romans and women got a pretty bad deal overall. But the fact that women had any legal recognition was good news compared to most of the societies contemporary with the Romans. It wasn't always like that. In the early days, Roman women were treated as property, much like cattle. Uh, but they were recognised as being independent actors in the Republic and for a long time under the emperors. Towards the end of the empire in the West, it was possible for women to become quite significant political figures. The most eyebrow-raising feature of Roman law for Gibbon, and indeed for us, was the ease of divorce. A marriage could be annulled unilaterally by either party. This was, on the whole, more to the man's than to the woman's advantage. The man was obliged to return any dowry paid with a deduction of a handling fee, but he could hold on to it if he could prove adultery, and no such rules applied to his behaviour. In the East, the rights of women see on the whole to have got worse as time went on. This was of a piece with a general increase in the power of the executive and an erosion of citizens' rights in general. Well, I suppose it's possible to support liberal causes overall without being a feminist, if you really wanted to. It doesn't really make much sense to be a feminist and not support liberal political ideas in general. When the state gets into repression in a big way, women are going to be one of the big recipients of that repression. That we get a couple of empresses in the later Eastern Empire I don't think is particularly significant to gender equality overall. It is easy to ignore a one-off like an empress, especially as the notion that the ruler was directly appointed by God was bedded in. God as we all know is licensed to move in mysterious ways. Homosexuality in Gibbon's time was so disapproved of he can't bring himself to say it outright so he's a little put out to discover that the early Romans really weren't that fussed about it. You could get fined for seducing a young boy but the penalty was trifling. Anyone who reads much Latin literature and not many people have read as much as Gibbon did will soon realise that it was simply a fact of life for the Romans. They didn't really tolerate it in the way modern society does. It wasn't a valid lifestyle choice and being the receiver of it was the cause of mockery. Um, Caesar takes it up the bum is one translation of some satirical comments on Julius Caesar on uh, some walls in Pompeii. Homosexuality was forced into the closet by Constantine who made it fully illegal for the first time and this was confirmed by Justinian's code. Homosexuality became a capital offence with mutilation of the genitals preceding the final sentence. In fact Given that his code eased up on some other sexual misconduct, you might interpret that as a further pushing of homosexuality out of the mainstream and into the dark place it was to be for many centuries. Indeed, I, I can still remember very clearly myself when accusing somebody of being queer was the worst available insult. 
This is not the subject which Gibbon throws much light on. As I say, he doesn't really want to talk about it. It isn't something we can really understand very clearly at the moment either. What, what one easy proposal is to simply blame it all on Christianity, but this doesn't really work. The horror of homosexuality seems to come in a long time after Christianity was already established, and its much later acceptance seems to come a long time after the more or less complete loss of influence uh, of Christianity in Europe, and while Christianity still has a very strong voice in the US. Um, so although you can justify op opposition to homosexuality by selective quotes from the Bible if you want to, you have to work pretty hard to do so. Overall, the holy text of Christianity seems to be more disapproving of eating shellfish. But evangelical groups are not looking for ways of helping people who just can't give up the crustaceans. Nobody's trying to pray away the prawns. So wherever homophobia is coming from, it doesn't seem to be originating in religion, even if religion is, as usual, a handy pretext for justifying the unjustifiable. Quite why this aspect of human behaviour became so disreputable for so long and then became largely accepted again is a bit of a mystery. It is to me anyway. Um, as I've actually lived through the change, I may be blind to something that will be obvious to observers in the future. Edward Gibbon was an enlightened thinker for his time and certainly not one who was scared of challenging the accepted beliefs around him, but he is unable to even spell out what he was talking about when he covers his issue. Uh, to his mind, the attitude of the Romans is remarkably lenient. The other thing that Gibbon covers, which is inseparable from the subject, is government. In fact, some people regard the law as one of the three arms of government, along with the process of creating legislation and the exercising of executive powers. This is something that gets looked at in different ways. As someone from the UK, where the legal system has grown up organically over the centuries, I tend to think of the courts as a separate entity from the government, although I'm well aware that there are some links between them. In the United States, the link between politics and law enforcement is a bit more explicit, and the appointments of judges is an openly political process. The other thing about law is the way it's part of the way states exert power over their citizens and as such legal matters are never that far from political ones. Laws prevent us from doing exactly what we want and inevitably sometimes stop us doing good things as well as bad ones. Basically we want and desire legal constraints on what people can do to us but would like the freedom to do as we please to other people. This is especially true of the behaviour of governments and it can be very frustrating when people we don't like use the law to get away with things that they shouldn't. A good example is that um, a radical Muslim activist spent over a decade using the British legal system to avoid being deported back to his own country. Surely someone in charge somewhere should be able to overrule him, but the trouble is that if you waive one person's rights, no matter how obnoxious they are, what is to stop everybody else's rights being steadily eroded? This dilemma was present in the Roman Empire and in Gibbon's own time, and it is interesting to read his take on it. He regards the best defence of individual rights as being the existence of an aristocracy. He speaks approvingly of the French one and points out that Britain is run by around 200 families who keep in check the potentially overmighty king. This rather grates with our modern idea of democracy, where governments are supposed to be representatives of all the people. But I wonder if things really are so different now. We've seen quite a lot of political upsets in the Western world recently, which are sometimes portrayed as a popular uprising against the elite. I don't think this is the whole story. These so-called popular uprisings seem to be surprisingly closely aligned to the interests of the very wealthy and are often funded by them. And the elites that are supposedly being rebelled against often turn out to be rather short of anything much resembling power. It's rather interesting to remember that the emperors were originally the ones who claimed, and maybe even actually had, the support of the people. Gibbon points out that despotism is ultimately the most egalitarian system, since everyone apart from the tyrant has exactly the same rights.
i.e. none. Maybe alternative power bases to the government are a good idea. The desire for a strong man to sort things out once and for all is seductive, but there aren't many examples in history of it working out that well. So, to conclude, Justinian's Code of Laws would have been a fascinating historical document in its own right simply for the light it sheds on the way the Roman Empire worked. It has also become a major building block of the kind of world that was to follow on from the fall of the Empire and continues to directly influence us to this day. Apart from the Latin language itself, it is probably the biggest single lasting presence of the Empire on the modern world. Justinian's wars are long forgotten, his architecture is still impressive but has long seen been, since been surpassed, but his legacy on the legal system of the West and beyond will last for millennia to come. Another thing that goes on for a long time is the period between my episodes. This project is a big one and I have many other calls on my time. I would love to devote more time to it but it really needs long blocks of time and I rarely seem to be able to find them. So I'm sure that many people who might otherwise have followed my output have probably cleared off and found more reliable sources for their history fix. But I still get the odd comment on iTunes and I've resolved to acknowledge them all. This means I'm going a long way back in time and there is every chance that the people I'm thanking have long since forgotten that this series even exists. Well, so be it. So, to thank a couple of specific long-suffering supporters who took the trouble to leave comments on the US iTunes store back in 2014. Thanks to Thinking Pleb, great comment and a great name. Also Maria Barger and Maggieist, much appreciated. We'll be back in Italy next time and in the meantime, thanks for listening.